keep track of our hazardous substances. We'll be looking at why you should be keeping track of your hazardous substances, what information you should be recording, how to use the tools that are available to do this, and also what is needed for substances that require hardcore tracking, the track substances under the regulations. I'd also like to thank those of you who submitted some substances in advance so we can use those as examples in the session today. So our very first question is, why should I keep track of my hazardous substances? And perhaps if you are able to pop a couple of suggestions into the chat there, we'll see if anyone's got any great ideas about those. And if not, we'll carry on. So the reasons that we should be keeping track of our hazardous substances, first of all, is just great business practice. You need to know what stock you have on hand. It's an important part of risk management. You can't manage the risks associated with your hazardous substances if you don't know what you have. And thirdly, you have to. The regulations require that the PCBU keep an inventory of their hazardous substances. And thirdly, fourthly, you really, really have to. Some of the hazardous substances that are the, the, the most hazardous require tracking. Now the track substances, we need to keep a really close eye on where those are around the country. So let's have a look at what is required for inventories. So our inventory, is to keep track of hazardous substances where they're used, handled, manufactured and stored. They need to be maintained up to date by the PCBU. This is a new thing that has come into the regulations since the changes in 2017, but it always has been a good idea. The inventory does not need to be kept if you've got a transit depot, but you do need to be able to have a record of what's available or what substances are present at your transit depot so that it, when emergency personnel arrive, you can tell them what is present. So this will be more in akin to a manifest of the hazardous substances at your transit depot. And you also don't need to record on the inventory any substances that you've got around the workplace that are consumer products that are being used in a, a manner and a quantity that is consistent with household use. So if you think about what substances you might have in the cafeteria uh, for cleaning the toilets in, a, in an office, things that you'd buy in the supermarket similar to what you'd use at home don't need to be included in your inventory. Your inventory does need to be accessible to emergency personnel during an emergency and after an evacuation. So this takes a lot of thinking about where you're actually going to keep the copies of your inventory. So in your evacuation kits, the information that your warden might have to take when they evacuate the site um, so that emergency personnel do have access to your inventory if you can't enter the building. And so you also need to take into consideration what would happen if there is an emergency after hours, and so you're providing support to emergency personnel, but you can't get into your building to access it. So whether you've got the information that is available electronically, um, reliably to provide the information as needed. Your inventory may also be required for your location compliance certification. Depending on the quantity that you've got, uh, the certifier doesn't always need to confirm inventory to be a compliance matter for your certificate. It's a bit around about how the regulations tie with that, but it will be one of the first things that your certifier will ask for when you've approached them to get a compliance certificate. They want to know what substance if you've got on site so they can determine whether or not you do need a compliance certificate and what precisely you need it for. And as we noted earlier, the inventory is a requirement under the regulations anyway.
just got a question there. There will be a copy of the presentation available after the, after the session. The inventory is required to have on it the name, so that's the product or the chemical name of the substance, and the UN number if one is available or applicable. You need to be recording the maximum quantity of the hazardous substance that's likely to be present. So the inventory that we're looking at here is not a running total of exactly how much is on site at a given time, but we're interested in the maximum that's likely to be present. We need to record the location of those substances. We also need to be recording any specific storage and segregation requirements, whether it needs to be kept separate from incompatibles, are there temperature control requirements, other things to help you manage storing your substances. The inventory also needs to include the safety data sheet. So this is keeping information with your inventory or keeping the safety data sheets with your inventory. Um, it can be the safety data sheet, or it might be a condensed version of the key information that is allowed by the regulations as well. And also, if you've got any hazardous waste, then this also does need to be included on the inventory now. This is one of the delayed implementations of the regulations, but hazardous waste does need to be included on the inventory. And when we're talking about hazardous waste, what we're talking about is substances that are um, perhaps a byproduct or um, a waste from a process. So it's not just a substance that's not needed anymore, that might have been out of date or expired. Those would still be considered the, the initial substance. But if there's a, a process waste, then that needs to be included on the inventory. The information that we need to keep on the inventory about the hazardous waste is a description of the waste. So for example, solvent waste, acid waste, um, acid waste containing hydrochloric acid and heavy metals. So something that can give us a description of what's actually in it. And again, the maximum quantity, location and storage and segregation information for our hazardous wastes as well. So that's what needs to be included on the inventory. So I've got a question for you. We'll just have a quick wee 20 second poll here. How do you keep your inventory on your sites? Do you use the hazardous substance calculator tool? Do you use another online tool for your hazardous substance inventory? Do you use a spreadsheet? Have you got some specific software that we might be using? Good old pen and paper? Or are you in the position of what inventory? I don't have one yet. So we're getting some votes coming through here. It'll be interesting to see how those come through. And I'll just final call for responses there. So it looks like the majority of you, half of you have responded, are using a spreadsheet. About a third of you are using the hazardous substances calculator. Um, we've got some people using other online means. Um, a handful of you are still using pen and paper, and only two of you have said what inventory. So. Hopefully that the session to correct that for you. That's how those came through. What we're going to be looking at in today's example is the hazardous substances calculator and the information that we need to get information into there. You can, once you've put the information into the calculator, you can use that um, and download it if you want to use it as a basis for a spreadsheet. So the Hazardous Substances Calculator is a tool on the Hazardous Substances Toolbox, which was initially put together by the EPA and WorkSafe and is now managed by WorkSafe at hazardoussubstances.govt.nz. And it's a really useful toolbox looking at information you need to manage your hazardous substances. So there's a guide on there and a workbook and there's also some really useful videos on there and a section of this toolbox is also dedicated to providing information about hazardous substances to your workers. Uh, but today we're going to be looking at the hazardous substances calculator. 
there is information on this page of the calculator and there are some short videos there on using it um, if you want to get a, a different opinion there. But we'll be looking at the calculator and how we get through to get the information that we want to manage our inventory. So once we go to create a new inventory down the bottom on, on the screen there, we can start going. Once you've already got your inventory, you can insert your pin to come back to change it, download it, add new substances to it, and just maintain it. When you create your inventory, you'll need to select whether it's for substances that are generally kept in closed containers or in open containers. The calculator provides more than just an inventory. It is giving you information about how you need to manage your substances. And because they change whether or not your inventory or your substances are open or closed, that's why you get this choice at the beginning. You'll want to give your inventory a name and you can go through and rename it later, but you cannot search for it by name and neither can anyone else. So the only way to get back into your inventory is through the pin that is generated. So we can see on the screen here, we've got our, our six digit pin, uh, it's usually an alpha or numerical one, and there's an option on the screen to email the pin to you so that you've got a record of that for when you need to come back to it. Anyone with that pin can get into the inventory. So if you did want to come through and have a play with the, the one that I've created for this webinar, um, anyone with that pin would in fact be able to do that. You can also duplicate your inventory. So if you wanted to, um, if you had multiple sites that had similar substances, you could start with one site and then duplicate it and make changes as you need further down. As we go through and develop our inventory, we'll see our list of uh, substances appearing on the list on the left and the hazardous substances control will appear on the right and so we're not going to be looking at those today but that will be information about how you need to manage your substances. Before we begin with entering our substances we'll need to have information on the approval or name of the substance, we'll need to have a copy of the safety data sheet and you'll want to know where it is and how much of it you have on site. And as we said earlier, what we're interested in is the maximum quantity at the various locations. So if you do have um, methylated spirits in three different stores around the site, you'll want to want add an entry for each of those locations. On the Hazardous Substances Toolbox website, there is a worksheet that you can use if you want to go around um, pen and paper to just get the initial information to enter into it. There's a, a form available on the website to do that. So what we'll have a look at now is the information, the fields that we're going to add the information, and then we'll have a look at some specific examples. So on our add a substance screen, there's a, a warning that only one person can make changes to an inventory at a time. So if you've all let on to try and um, have a play with the webinar inventory, um, hopefully someone's got an error message. Um, not all the information will be saved. So we're going to start by entering in the substance name or the approval. And so we need either the approval number, and we'll see where these come from in our safety data sheet, or for some of the common substances, you can actually enter it by name. So there are a lot of substances, uh, common chemicals that are in listed individually, like petrol, LPG, and diesel. If you've got pure chemicals, you can use the CAS number, the chemical abstracts number, which again will be on the um, safety data sheet, or the group standard name, and we'll see more about group standards later. You can also enter three non-substance descriptions, so if it's something that's manufactured on site, so it might be an intermediate stage in your process that you're wanting to just keep track of where that is. You can enter your hazardous waste, and you can also enter non-hazardous substances as well. You can also enter a name that you use when you are referring to the substance. So if you've got um, a particular trade name or a product name that you use in-house, then you can enter that name um, to be recorded on the inventory for that substance. It will just make the, the whole resource more user-friendly for everyone at your work safe, at your work site. So I said you could enter non-hazardous substances. Um, Anyone like to suggest on the chat why you might want to do that?
So I had a couple of questions come through just if anyone's thinking about why you'd want to enter non-hazardous substances. Um, so one is, can anyone other than the pin holder access your inventory, such as the fire service or WorkSafe? They would need the pin number to be able to come through and access this. WorkSafe don't keep this as a, a resource of what hazardous substances are available on the worksite on the on the um, around the country. So you do need the pin to access that. So a couple of answers for not has not for entering non-hazardous substances. Um, to save confusion with consumer items, yes, that's a great answer there. And some of the compressed gases still pose risks. So that's some really great examples there. So you can uh, make this a one-stop shop for your substances. And certainly if you've got substances that may or may not be hazardous and you're not sure, you've figured out that they're non-hazardous, you might want to keep them on your inventory so that you have got a, a positive re record on your inventory that you've got the substance and it's not hazardous. So that when an inspector or a worker or a certifier is coming to your site and asking about this product, you can just say, no, we know we've got it, we know it's not hazardous, it's on the inventory. With the point about non-hazardous compressed gases. They are available to enter as a, a particular substance on the inventory. They are still subject to the hazardous substance regulations. So uh, things like nitrogen, the non-flammable, non-toxic, but they are still managed under the hazardous substance regulations as a compressed gas. So that's great. Thank you for that participation. So the next information that we will be recording is about the safety data sheet. And so what we're looking to record here is the expiry date of your safety data sheet. Um, and if it's out of date, then we can tick on that. We want to put in the UN number. So this is the UN number for substances that are dangerous goods for transport. That information will be in section 14 of the safety data sheets. And also we can enter in our storage and segregation requirements. So we can see we're getting the exact information that's required by the regulations coming through. We'll want to record a location for our substance. And so there is a selection of default locations in the calculator. So dangerous goods stores, whether in a building or a separate building, an indoor storage cabinet, an outdoor open area, a workroom or an other location. So you can add, when you select other location, it will give you an opportunity to um, enter a name for that. And that name will then become available as an item for this inventory going forward. So you can make those some really descriptive um, entries in there to make it really easy for people to find the substances on your site, rather than if you've got you know, three separate dangerous goods stores, having them all listed just as dangerous goods store. Um, we'll talk about uh, uh, so discussion for another time about the pros and cons of having multiple locations in one inventory versus having multiple inventories. Um, and there are different implications for those, so I'm not going to cover those today. You will be asked, you may be asked whether you know the HASNO classification for the substance. So if it's a substance that the inventory already knows the classification for, like LPG or petrol or a specifically approved pesticide, we won't need to enter it in. But if it's something that might be approved under a group standard, then we'll be asked if we do know the classification. If the safety data sheet doesn't have the classification on it, then we can get a good estimate of the, the key hazard properties from the transport information. So that's the UN class number, the UN packing group um, from the safety data sheet. The substance state, whether it's a solid, liquid, gas or aerosol, again, is usually pre-populated from the substance information, but there are a number of things that could be either a solid or a liquid on their approval, and you'll be asked for that because that does make a difference to some of the controls that are in place on the substances. You'll be asked whether or not the substance is held in a stationary container, so a tank or a process container, and then again, there's a description of what type of process, of what type of stationary container it is. And then finally, you're asked for the amount held. Um, 
and whether it's litres or kilograms or cubic metres will depend on the state of the substance. And that can be a decimal figure. So it can go down to four decimal places. So you can have substance quantities, depending on your site, down to 100 milligrams or up to you know, 10 million tonne, 10 million kilograms of substance on your site. So a laboratory might have a lot of substances in very small quantities, or you might be a large manufacturing or storage site where you've got things in the millions of litres. And so the calculator can manage that whole range. So that's the information that we'll be looking for. And so now we're going to have a look at some examples. And I just have to ask if there's any particular preferences that you would like to see in particular, keeping an eye on the time. So if you want to have a wee vote on your, your favorite substances to see, um, we'll go through those in that order. And just counting down a couple more seconds. Perfect. Thanks, guys. So we'll start we'll through with those. It looks like we can just chop the, the wasp colour off at the end as we get there. So we'll get started on LPG as our example. So I've just taken for each example the key sections from the safety data sheet so that we'll need in order to populate our inventory. So generally we're looking at the product name, the hazards identification, the handling and storage, and then we might also, depending on the safety data sheet, need to look at the transport section and also the regulatory information section information section, which we'll see in some of the other examples. But we can see for our LPG that the information that we need is just on the very first few sections that we've got. So going through to add a substance, LPG is a common substance. We can just type LPG into the search field and it appears there on the drop down list. So we'll be able to select that just straight away. We can add change the substance name for this. So in this example, I've just made a note that these are our forklift cylinders. So that when you are looking at a, an inventory where you might have three or four different stores of LPG, you might have a barbecue cylinder, you might have your forklift cylinders, you might have a, a pile of 45 kilo ones for water heating, and there might also be a bulk tank on site. If we identify those in the substance name, it makes it really easy to see what we're referring to. We're recording the safety data sheet expiry date, and so safety data sheets need to be re refreshed or updated every five years. So our expiry date is five years from the issue date. Um, so we need to do a little bit of maths here. Um, 2018 should be one that expires in 2023. If it's one that is older than five years old, then just select out of date when you're doing it. Uh, the information is not mandatory, so you can get through um, part of your inventory without adding all the information in. And then we've got the substance UN number, and we've seen that on our hazards identification, uh, 1075 for LPG. We want to put in the safe storage and segregation requirements, and so the easiest thing to do here is to actually copy and paste that from the safety data sheet into that section, and then we're going to have a good resource for use by everyone on site later. There. You can just type anything that you like in that field. Um, if you don't have that information to hand or you want to do a review of it, then you can do that um, through um, um, when you update it at a later date. We're looking at where we've located it, so we've just selected an open outdoor area. Hopefully that is where all our LPG is located outside. And it's not in a stationary tank for our forklift cylinders made a note that we've got 90 kilograms and we've added the substance. And so this is what the entry on the inventory on the left-hand side will look like. It's giving us the approval number, the expiry date, the UE number, those storage and segregation requirements that we pasted in. It's telling us that it's a gas, it's hazard classification. So we didn't need to enter the classification in for LPG. The calculator knows that it's a class 2.1.1A flammable gas and it's got our location. And so that's a, a really straightforward example, uh, looking at just what's needed for LPG. 
For the next example, we're going to have a look at hand sanitizer, uh, very timely and topical here. And in this example, we've got one that is um, not a New Zealand one. Uh, just looking at another question that we've had come through. If we've had two areas of storage, what is the maximum amount um, we put for both? So if you've got two areas of storage, I would have those as separate locations and just record the quantity, the maximum quantity likely to be at either one. Although if you've got a situation where the maximum on site is say 100 kilograms, but there could be either 100 kilograms at one or 100 kilograms at another. That's just something that um, you'll just need to think about the logistics of your site as to how that will actually work. So with our hand sanitizer example, uh, this is an international safety data sheet, so it's not necessarily going to have all the information that we require on it looking at the sections that we need. So identify the product, the hazards associated with it. And we will talk in a couple of areas about the GHS. This is the globally harmonized system for the classification and labeling of substances. And this is what HASNA was based on and what we're going to be moving to in New Zealand as well, to the GHS. I'll talk a bit about that later. We'll need the sections on handling and storing our substance. And we'll also need our transport information to get the information that we need into our database. So when we go to add our substance, it's not, it's an ethanol and alcohol based sanitizer, but that's not the only thing in it. So we're going to need to add information about the approval for this substance. And this is one of the main reasons that it is so important that you get your safety data sheet from your New Zealand supplier. So it is the responsibility of your supplier to provide you with the safety data sheet that is compliant with the New Zealand regulations. If you are importing the substance yourself and you're supplying it onto someone else, then you have the responsibility to make sure that the, data, the safety data sheet being provided is compliant. And if you're importing it yourself just for your own use, then you'll need to find out some of the extra information about the New Zealand approval status, and your supplier internationally may not be interested in the compliance for one or two clients in New Zealand. For our hand sanitizer, we're looking at the group standard here for cosmetic products, and so looking at the definition for these is really important. But because this is a product that is designed to come into contact with the external parts of the body for cleaning or protecting them, then it does fall under the cosmetic products group standard and not the cleaning products. And we'll see the exclusion in the definition of a cleaning product doesn't include anything cosmetic. So anything that is designed to come in contact with the, the, with the body should be under the cosmetic product group standard and there are a lot of controls around that. So we'll select the cosmetic product group standard as our substance and then actually given it the name of hand sanitizer that we're going to use on site. Now I'm just going to give a wee um, diversion into group standards so that if you do have an international safety data sheet, the group standards are based on the um, what the substance is used for. So there are, are quite a few categories of substances in our group standards. And so it's a matter of finding the, the right mix of the use and the hazard of the substance to find the right approval for our substance. But that is quite a different uh, and more in-depth process. So just a, a wee brief diversion there. I'm going to add more information about our hand sanitizer. Its expiry date there is March 2025. It was uh, newly updated at the beginning of March for, for some reason, uh, hand sanitizer. The UN number is on the safety data sheet there. So in this case, it is in section 14, the UN number is 1170, and copying in the precautions for storage into our um, calculator. We've selected a location for our hand sanitizer. We're gonna keep it in an internal storage cabinet. And our 
inventory, our safety data sheet didn't give us the HASNA classifications, it was an international safety data sheet, so we're going to see here that we don't know the HASNA classification for the substance, and so we can get the UN class and the packing group number from the transport section, and that will give us some information to help manage our substance safely. So it's a class three, packing group two, ethanol solution. And then the last things for our sanitizer, it's a liquid, more likely a gel, but liquid would cover both. It's not in a stationary container. Also, we've got 50 litres of it, and we'll add it to our inventory. So we're going to move on to our next example of interest, which was our cost it. So we've got our safety data sheet. So I've got a product name and dates. We've got a good list of hazard classifications here. We've got our handling and storage information, our transport and our regulatory information. So our HASNO approval number for this product is listed in section 15 of the safety data sheet. And we'll see how this goes through as we add them in. So our approval number from section 15, HSR has a substance approved for release, 2491. So we just start typing 2491 in there. We'll see that it's coming up as the additives, processed chemicals, and raw materials corrosive group standard. And that matches with what's on the safety data sheet, which is a, a really great start. We want to give it a, a name to use on site because we don't want to be keep calling it processed materials, additives, and raw materials. Uh, we'll call it caustic. Uh, you might give it call it sodium hydroxide, you might have a different name for it. We've got the safety data sheet expiry date, and we've got the UN number from the data sheet as well. We've got some storage and segregation requirements, don't stir it near acids, keep it closed, keep out of reach of cold children, and there's also a recommended storage temperature range here that we can add in to our inventory. The next part is looking a bit more different, so this is do we know our has no classifications for this substance? And yes, we do. They're listed on the safety data sheet in section two. And so we can just go down and enter in, tick each box as we go through for our corrosive to metals, our acute toxicity. And in this example, we can see that there's a 6.1D and a 6.1E acute toxicity, and that depends on the route of exposure. So whether oral or ingestion or something going through the skin, the dermal toxicity. And we only get to choose one classification for the calculator. And so we're just going to select the most hazardous one, one of the highest degree of hazard. And so that would be um, A, B, C, D would be the one that we would select. It's got skin corrosion, it's got serious eye damage, 8.3A, and it also has some um, ecotoxic properties as well. So we can just go through and tick the classifications that the safety data sheet is telling us. Our substance state, this is a liquid, we don't have it in a stationary container, and in this case we've got three drums of it, we'll add in 600 litres. So we can see that if we've got a good safety data sheet, the information that we need to enter into the database is really quite straightforward. I'll give one more example and we'll just have a look at paint here. Again, we'll grab a, a safety data sheet, again, a, a nice New Zealand compliant one with the approval information uh, right at the front in the hazards identification section here. We've got our handling and storage and our transport information. And so we'll have a look at the types of information that we can get for adding into our calculator. The group standard listed there is the surface coatings and colorants, flammable and toxic 6.7 group standard. So in our group standards, we've got the, the type of use that it's for, the surface coatings and colorants, and then an indication of the key hazards associated with this grouping of surface coatings. So in this case, it's flammable, and it's also potentially carcinogenic, the toxic 6.7. We'll give this a, a substance name, and what you might find is if you've got a lot of paint products or something similar, that you may not want to enter 25 different colours of the same paint into your inventory. So we could group those together if they've got very similar hazardous properties. And so I've made a note here that these are our exterior varnishes in assorted colours, and I've also noted that they've got them in containers greater than five litres. And again, that will just help you when you're using your inventory and the controls information for identifying exactly what grouping of substances that you need.
For flammable liquids, whether it's in a container bigger or smaller than five litres, makes a, a significant difference to some of the controls in place, which is why I've done it for this example and not for some of the others. We've got our expiry date, so this is one that would need to be reviewed later this year, and our UN number as well. We'll pop in our storage and segregation requirements, and we're going to use another location here. So we're going to just make a note that this is the flammable liquid store in our rear yard. Um, this is where we're going to keep our varnishes. And as I said earlier, this will make the um, location appear on that drop down list if you're then going to add in your thinners um, and your other paints that might be kept out there as well. So that list, that store will appear in your list. With the safety data sheet that we had, it does list our hazard classifications. And we can, if we compare this to the one for caustic, we didn't get an option for class 3.1 without caustic. It doesn't fit with the approval, the group standard that we selected. So you'll only be presented with options that are relevant to your um, uh, approval that you've selected. So if we were looking at our uh, hazard classification and uh, an 8.2b appeared on the left there and it's not an option on the right with the classification selection, it's an indication that we don't have the right approval selected. Uh, and then it's uh, just a matter of uh, selecting those. One of the things that we did see on the safety data sheet, and I'm going to give you as an example, is where it doesn't have the, has no classification, but it has GHS information. So the GHS, as I said, the Globally Harmonised System, um, is the international system that HESNA was based on and that we are going to be moving um, towards. At the moment, a safety data sheet that only shows GHS information and doesn't show it has no classification is still compliant. So you will see, you may see compliant safety data sheets from your supplier with only the GHS information on it, and that is fine. Um, the EPA has just on, on Monday released the next stage of consultation for how we're going to be moving to GHS and away from the HASNA classifications. And so we can expect that the toolbox calculator will be updated to reflect that. But in the meantime, if you've only got the GHS hazard categories or the hazard statements, you can use a correlation table to match those up. And so we'll just have a look at an example of these. So with our GHS categories, so rather than being a 3.1C flammable liquid, what we might see is flammable liquid category 3, and that correlates to a 3.1C. You may also see the hazard statements listed um, with a, a statement code. So that H226 is the lookup code for flammable liquid and vapour. If it was more flammable, then it would say highly flammable liquid and vapour. And if it was more flammable again, if it was a 3.1A, it would read extremely flammable liquid and vapour. So we can use the hazard statements from the GHS or the GHS category to correlate that through to the HASNO classifications, as we can see highlighted in yellow there. And very pleasing to see that they, they do match up to the classification that was listed on the safety data sheet. The one that was looking a bit different was around the narcotic toxicity. So this is, um, it'll make you dizzy, make you feel a bit um, high, a bit of neurotoxicity, short term from smelling, sniffing um, the solvents associated with the paint. And because it's not, precisely matched up, the safety data sheet just listed it as a 6.9B, uh, a 6.9, whereas the, the correlation would say it was a 6.9B there. So that's just a, a wee diversion onto the, the GHS that you will certainly be seeing on your safety data sheets. Um, as I said earlier, the container size matters for our paint, and then we can have our cap maximum capacity and our, um, add that to the inventory. So I'll just skip past now. We've got plenty of examples and some key things there. And see how our inventory is actually looking. So now the left-hand side of the uh, inventory screen, if you were going onto the calculator, would have that list of five substances that we've entered. And we do have a couple of options for getting um, a, a printed copy to manage our inventory. So we can either uh, print a copy of the controls report or we can download it. So we'll just have a look at an example of those. 
So to print the controls report at the start of the report will just give you a, a list of the inventory, what the substance is, the, all the information that we've added about it, and that will act as a, a, a compliant inventory for you. It's got all the information that's needed. It does list it in alphabetical order, uh, which is not always the most practical. So for uh, if you've got a complicated site, more than um, a dozen or so substances, you're probably wanting to export it as a spreadsheet. And obviously, once you've downloaded it in CSV form as a, a, into a spreadsheet, you can then reformat it to a manner that's going to be much more user friendly for you. So in this case, obviously, made it all readable um, and sorted it by location in this case so that we can see the, the two substances that we had recorded in our indoor storage cabinet um, are now grouped together. And we can see that the, the storage and segregation information that we've pasted into the calculator is coming through quite nicely on the spreadsheet. And we can do things like sort by quantity, filter by hazard class, um, sort our safety data sheets into order of which ones are expiring soon. Um, and if needed, you could add additional columns for whatever purposes you needed on site. So to get the information into a perhaps a more usable form, you can download the spreadsheet there. I'll just give an opportunity to see if there are any more questions about the inventory, and then we'll move on to the, the next topic. So I had a question about the, um, the non-hazardous compressed gases. So there is a group standard for compressed gases, um, which includes the ones that are non-hazardous, or things like um, argon and nitrogen. Um, you can just type those chemical names in, they should be there. If it was a, a mix, like a, an argo shield mix, then that would come under the compressed gas non-hazardous group standard, and it should be entered that way. So what about the track substances? So this is a particular set of substances where we need to keep a, a record of the, of the most hazardous substances. So these are um, a range of explosives, and explosives isn't an area where I'm an expert, so we'll say some do and some don't. But we're looking at the 3.1A highly flammable liquids, uh, a range of the class 4A substances, uh, highly um, oxidizing liquids, uh, organic peroxides that are 5.2A or 5.2B, they are very um, reactive substances, and also our 6.1A and 6.1B toxic substances are trapped. The 6.1A and the 6.1B substances are also the only ones that need a, a certified handler um, excluding some of the um, explosives. In addition to those classes that require tracking, there are also specific substances that are added to the list of substances needing tracking. Um, I'll have a look, uh, pop online at the end of the session, Jessica, and have a look at the compressed gas one and just see if there's something odd there. So we other substances that might not have one of those classes are tracked. So there are a range of specific vertebrate toxic agent baits that need to be tracked, um, some of the fumigants. Um, and one of um, industrial note is hydrofluoric acid, um, class uh, of 1 to 7% is a 6.1C toxic substance. So it doesn't trigger a class, it requires tracking. But because of the, um, the particular nature and ubiquity of that product, um, it is, does require tracking, um, even though the class wouldn't indicate it. And we can see that on, if you were to enter that onto the calculator, So those, those controls that we weren't talking about in the inventory section, if we were to enter hydrofluoric acid of 1 to 7% into the inventory, we can see on the right-hand side there that tracking is one of the controls that appears for it. In addition to the list of substances that do need tracking, there is another list of substances that do not require tracking. So petrol is a class 3.1A flammable liquid, um, and obviously the, the practicalities of tracking 
every quantity of petrol around the country um, wouldn't work. So petrol doesn't require tracking and it appears in the regulations under that section there. Uh, another common example is hydrochloric acid. It's a 6.1B toxic substance. You can buy it in the hardware store. It makes a, a great concrete cleaner. And so it's one that's being added into the, the regulations as not requiring tracking. And there's also a range of um, veterinary medicines that are sort of ready to use. They may be quite toxic, but the, the dose size and how they're actually used in veterinary practice means that they don't require tracking. And again, once we were, we were to enter those substances into the calculator, we can see for the hydrochloric acid, it would show it's a 6.1B, but the tracking control does not appear because it's one that has been removed. That list can be changed by means of a safe work instrument. And so there's a additional substances that do not require tracking safe work instrument. I'm certainly good at giving names to these. Uh, and so that includes a couple of extra fuel blends there as well. So the two stroke fuel that's pre-mixed and petrol methanol blends have been added in to the substances that don't need tracking um, safe work instrument. So we'll have a look at what actually needs to be in our tracking record. So a PCBU where the track substance is present needs to keep a record of the location and movement of the track substance um, over its life cycle. And we'll look at that, what that is shortly. It needs to be kept for one year from when it's been transferred or three years from disposal or treatment. So treatment might include um, incorporating it into another substance, it might be reacted or used or diluted, um, and that other substance that it's been treated into uh, may or may not itself be tracked. So if it's been made into something that's no longer tracked, we need to keep that record for three years um, at that point. When we're looking at life cycle, we're basically looking at the, the time that the substance is in existence from its import and manufacturer till its disposal, and it does include things like storage, use, and transport of those substances. So we're making sure that we know what's happened to these track substances. The tracking record needs to be readily accessible to any worker handling the substance, and it also needs to be readily understandable to the competent person who needs to have access to the substance. You'll be asking who your competent person is. So that is the certified handler, if it is applicable to that substance, so with certain explosives and toxic substances needing a certified handler. Or if it's a substance that doesn't need a certified handler, then it's going to be the, the nominated competent person related to that substance who has received the training, information and instruction uh, required by Regulation 4.5. Regulation 4.5 is the one that says any person who is handling or using or storing hazardous substances needs to have training. The information that we need to keep in our tracking record is who the competent person is, information about the substance, and for some of the um, vertebrate toxic agents, that includes a unique uh, serial number for each batch of it. We need to have information about the location, and the regulations say that if you're looking at your tracking record, then someone looking at the record should be able to identify what that exact location is within two minutes of looking at the record, and then within an hour, being able to physically locate the substance or, or the um, container. We need to keep a record of the any transfer of the substance, so what the product is, who's receiving it and when, and also disposal, so how we've disposed of it, when, how much, and where it was disposed of. Disposal is making something um, no longer a hazardous substance, so if, you are, um, if you've got some track substance that you are giving to a waste contractor who will do the disposal, you are transferring it, and then the waste contractor will be the one doing the disposal. When we're looking at transfer, so this is coming up with sale and purchase, this is what your supplier will be asking for of you when you buy a track substance. They need to have a written notification of who the competent person at the workplace receiving the substance is. If you are getting a quantity of substance that would require a location compliance certificate, then confirming with your supplier that you do have the location compliance certificate. So it is about the substance and the amount. 
and also that any transit arrangement, so if it's going to be stopping on place, um, it's not going directly to the workplace, that it's going to a transit depot, or that there are appropriate emergency management procedures in place um, if needed. And so we'll just have a wee chat about the difference between tracking and an inventory. So both records are about the location and quantity of your substances. Tracking is a record of the people responsible for the substance and the activity that happens to it. Um, and you may be able to adapt your stock management records uh, to help manage your tracking. It's something that you do need to be updating regularly if you've got a, a throughput of those tracked substances. If you're in a situation where you might be a laboratory where you've got a, a container of a tracked substance and the particular analysis or whatever you're doing with it involves taking a small quantity out for each um, process, then you might have a record that says, we use it for this, and each year you do a, a stop take of approximately how much is left of that container, as well as keeping track of the individual containers of it. The inventory is about a record of what's on site and the, the key information about how to store it safely, including the safety data sheets. Your inventory doesn't need to change as your stock levels go up and down, only if there's a change to the maximum that is likely to be present or if there are new substances or, or changed locations. And so that's what I had to talk to you about today. Are there any questions? So we have had one about those compressed um, gas ones. So I'll just see if we can flick online to the calculator. Bear with me while I try that. And we'll see if indeed the issue that was coming up is not there. So we've got our compressed gas mixtures. When you are searching on the inventory, the full list doesn't come up. So we may have to go through with compressed gas mixtures. So it does seem that there may be a uh, an issue with that group standard. I'll have a look into it in more detail. Um, but nitric and gas is an example of a non-toxic gas does appear. And just are there any other questions that people might have? Should a copy of the tracking record be given at transfer or to the disposal company? I think it's, it's more that a tracking record needs to be kept by the PCBU and by the, the, tracking, by the, 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 the other party to the transfer or the disposal. So it's not necessarily like a, um, a shipping note that might be sent with it, but both parties need to be creating a record of that information and providing a, a record that gives all that information to them may be a very practical way of doing that. If there's nothing else here, thank you very much for your time. As mentioned earlier, a recording of the session will be made available later and we will, um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact any of us here at Chem Safety. Thank you. Oh, one more chat. Oh, thank you.